It could be argued that this was the birth of the most popular segment of automobiles to ever roll around on planet Earth, the sports utility vehicle. From 1941 to 45, the Willys Jeep and its Ford counterpart were depended upon by service members to get them to anywhere they needed to go as World War II raged on. Mixing practicality and durability, more than 650,000 were made, and this vehicle made a compelling case for a different type of automobile for the masses. A few decades later, as a natural progression, we would begin to see vehicles like these on American roads. The International, the Bronco, the Land Cruiser. Once people saw the go-anywhere logic of these things, every automaker began making them, and vehicles like the Toyota 4Runner and the Jeep Wagoneer were taking us beachcombing, rock climbing, spelunking. But by the mid-2000s, something horrible happened. You see, auto manufacturers can't resist slicing every vehicle segment into ever thinner and more cynical sub-segments. And they started making cars that weren't SUVs, they weren't sedans, they weren't sports cars. They were just... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <clears throat> it's just, well, these things are just some lump of car. Uh, sure, they have four wheels and they roll forward and they get you places. And if that's all you're concerned about, well then more power to you. But if you're even a little bit worried about not being completely miserable when you get behind the wheel, this, I don't even know who makes this, and I don't care. No, I can't let that pass. Nissan calls this the Rogue, and it's the least roguish car on earth. What's worse is the marketing people did a tie-in between this car and a Star Wars movie. No, just no. They should have called it the Bland. It manages to be hideous and utterly dismal at the same time. I think a gerbil under the hood running in a spinning wheel makes it go, and the interior, while not devoid of some comforts, is as unoffending as it is uninspired. But it sits like two inches higher than a car, so rental companies and soccer moms call this a sports utility vehicle. But it's just not. Say it with me, kids. Yes, this is a crossover. That's marketing speak for something slower than a truck with no towing capacity that can't off-road through a mud puddle and has about the same utility as any sedan with a decent trunk. It's so pathetic, it shouldn't exist. And yet this, and clones like it from every automaker on the planet, sell like crazy. And I understand. Sort of. See, it used to be if you wanted an SUV, you had the four-wheelers I mentioned earlier, or something like this. Yeah, the Willys Jeep never really went away. The Jeep Wrangler, its offspring, is all the things we want for fun off-roading, endless personalization, and you can even fit a bit of cargo in it if you're clever about it. But this is a JK Wrangler, and as fun as it is, it doesn't really drive like a car. It's loud, it's bumpy, this one's got a top that leaks when it drizzles. The fact is, until Jeep made the new JL Wrangler, which is quite a bit more refined than previous model years, the mom with SUV dreams wouldn't hit the highway in something like this, and she'd be forced to shop for a... a crossover. But times have changed, and buyers have options. So what do you look for when you want an actually capable off-roader that's got creature comforts on the highway and good for people hauling? Will you buy the world's best SUV, the Land Rover Defender? Now, when waxing poetic about great four-wheel drive cars of the day, the Land Rover brand has every reason to hold its head high. Its time as an off-roader is second only to the Willys Jeep crowd. Let's be honest, there's some legacy and history here. Though the Defender didn't enter the world until a few decades ago, its predecessor, the Land Rover Series 1, 2, and 3, were made by Rover and British Leland from the late 40s through the 80s. These vehicles went anywhere, did anything, and served as military trucks, ambulances, transport, you name it. As vehicles like the original Defender came to be, the idea of a rugged off-roader that could be comfortable around town was here to stay. So revered was the Defender that redesigning the car for the modern era became a mixture of homage to the past greatness of one of the first true SUVs and a bold reimagining of what comfortable capability should be. This Defender came into my stable after a really wonderful ownership experience with a second-generation Range Rover Sport. That car was supremely comfortable, a real head-turner, and get this, 100% trouble-free. That's a feat for Land Rover. 
and a record that the Defender can't really hold its head up to. But more on that later. So why Land Rover and why the Defender? Well, going back to the thesis for this episode, I asked myself, if I need a people carrier for my family and I refuse to drive a minivan, oh, and I do, there aren't enough buckets in the world to carry all the sick I'd feel if I drove one, why not drive a car that carries four people comfortably and is also capable? Why live with the soul-crushing numbness of driving a vehicle that isn't a car, isn't a truck, isn't really necessary? Now, I spent a little more than I should have because I have an illness. I'm a car junkie. But again, we have options these days, and you don't have to spend a fortune to drive a capable car that's actually enjoyable and fun. When selecting this particular model, I was pretty set on the hero color for this car, a very nice green that Land Rover calls Pangea. But on the lot, I saw this black on black on khaki, and man, is it menacing. It's not the V8 monster machine driven by James Bond villains in No Time to Die, but it could be mistaken for that version, which would come out two years later. And on that note, let's talk powertrain. Land Rover makes SUVs that are plenty powerful on the road, and the Defender can be had with any number of engines. The P400 is a 3-liter V6, making 395 horsepower, and importantly, this engine produces 406 foot-pounds of torque, which you feel in this car. Want to carry loads of gear? This powertrain is good for 8,200 pounds of towing capacity. All of that works together to shove this big block of a car through the air in under six seconds from zero to 60. And that's plenty fast enough for me. As much as I like cars that go fast, I've often felt that I don't need a sub five second zero to 60 time in an SUV. That's just overkill. Hence, I don't need the Bond villain V8 version. Now, as I mentioned, an SUV for me, even one this capable, needs to have creature comforts. And Land Rover's built the Defender like a heavyweight boxer that knows how to clean up for a night on the Riviera. Things like heated and cooled seats, heated steering wheel, digital instrument cluster and touchscreen that are very customizable and include Apple CarPlay, a Meridian sound system that sounds great, panoramic sunroof, the digital rear view mirror that you can flip a switch on and, and go to camera view when you need to because you may be towing a trailer or have visibility issues from carrying cargo. All of that couples with things like spray out floor mats and a car you can throw the dogs in and go to the beach. And it makes this strange mix of plush and posh and utilitarian at the same time. This duality of comfort and utility are seen in the ways Land Rover integrates the brilliant off-road system and the controls for climate here on the dash. Pushing and rotating these dials gives access to everything from climate control to seat heating and cooling and even off-road controls. With this panel on the gear lever mounted on the dash so that an optional third front row seat can be added, these controls allow the driver to select any number of road functions, engage hill descent, monitor the 35.4 inches of wading depth, and activate the air suspension ride height controls. A short time after I purchased the Defender, I took it to the Land Rover off-road course at the Biltmore Estate in North Carolina. It's an experience I highly recommend, and as a novice off-roader, I learned a ton. And while on the course, I asked the instructor about the Defender and asked him how it stacked up against other Land Rovers, and he proclaimed the Defender as the most capable Land Rover of the day. And that's saying something. With its short overhangs, excellent off-road systems, and cameras that allow you to see everything around you as you traverse any terrain, the Defender really does inspire confidence. And when you're done with your four-wheeling fun, wash out mats and spray out vinyl floors mean you can clean the mud up and shine the Defender up for an evening at the theater. In fact, it's this mix of rugged good looks and comfort that makes this car so appealing. It's classy but not stuffy. Even cool design touches like safari windows, visible bolts, and leaving this magnesium structural member exposed to the cabin and stamping it Defender really add to the action hero who drinks fine wine character of this car. Yeah, but it's not all peachy, and this car isn't without its issues. You know, most SUVs are valued for their cargo space, and the Defender has this nice boxy shape and fold-down rear seats, plenty of cargo room, but it's also got this legacy swinging door, and that means if you want to carry 10-foot 2x4s, you're not hanging them out the back. And as for reliability and dependability, a long-held joke for Land Rover models, how does the Defender stack up against my incredibly trouble-free Range Rover Sport? Well, not so well. This car spent more time with a dealer than a pit boss. Things like plastic welds in the glass of both rear windows has had to be replaced. Numerous check engine lights and visits to the dealer to replace parts and deal with recalls. Uh, a touchscreen interface up front that likes to show crazy colors until you restart the car. A sunroof that sometimes won't close until you get the right combination of buttons. 
This car might prove that the old wisdom about staying away from debut model years is good practice. But of course, in love and cars, most of us fall for looks, and that was my first attraction to the Defender. For me, it's the black 20-inch wheels and the Tonka truck proportions, and I never cease to be enthralled with design touches like square taillights that harken back to the old Defender while still looking modern. So what I'm trying to say is, I leave you with a plea. There have been times of old, dark, cold, dismal ages where the big three made horrible cars that we couldn't reasonably be expected to enjoy. But those times are gone. And that is really all I'm trying to say. If we have to drive, then pick something that makes you smile. You know, honestly, the Defender is a lot of vehicle. It's not inexpensive. And thankfully, since I bought this, the marketplace for a family carrier that's also capable off-road has ballooned. Things like the aforementioned JL Jeep Wrangler and the revision of its cousin, the Grand Cherokee, the return of the Ford Bronco, the venerable Toyota 4Runner. These are just a few examples of cars out there that will carry a family in style and comfort and are also capable of some fun. And if you have to choose a, <clears throat> a crossover, well, there are makers like Volvo and Hyundai and Subaru that make some pretty darn good examples of those too. My fellow humans, all I'm trying to say is life is too short for us to drive boring cars. Thanks for watching.